uh, conversation with Korea. Um, uh, to start us off, uh, we have some introductory remarks uh, by Ambassador Shin Bong Gil, who is president of uh, IFANS, the Institute for Foreign Affairs and National Security. So, Ambassador Shin, thank you for joining us this morning. The stage is yours. <clears throat> First of all, as the president of IFANS, I'm happy to join a large audience in this public symposium held under the theme, A Conversation About Korea and the United States. I would like to extend my special thanks to the CSIS and the Korea Chair Victor Cha for having organized this symposium. This year marks the 70th anniversary of the end of World War II, and it's a special year for the Koreans as we mark the 70th anniversary of our liberation, as well as the division of the two Koreas. Korea is the only country that remains divided after the Second World War with the longest armistice in modern history. Division of the peninsula has left Koreans to pay such high price for the past 70 years the humanitarian costs, including the pains of separate families, the grave human rights situation in North Korea, the growing instability and tension caused by the North's development of nuclear weapons and long-distance missiles are just a part of the huge costs that we had to pay. The costs of division pose burdens, not just for Koreans, but the whole world. Under these circumstances, President Park Geun-hye of the Republic of Korea made a speech at Dresden University, Germany, in March last year, where she proposed three agendas for unification as a first step to pave the way for resolving Korea's division, namely the Agenda for Humanity, Agenda for Co-Prosperity, and Agenda for Integration. She mentioned that the Korean unification would be a bonanza, not only for Koreans, but for the entire world. In this line, the Korean government has launched the Unification Preparatory Committee in July last year and started drafting the blueprint for the unified Korea and establishing the national consensus. The committee also proposed for holding inter-Korean talks on December 29th. We are, we are well aware that the support of the neighboring countries is absolutely essential in realizing the Korean unification, as we have seen from the German experience. An international environment should also be shaped in, a way, in ways that is favorable to Korean unification. Hence, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Korea has set diplomacy focused on preparation for unification as the core diplomatic agenda for 2015. However, we all know it too well that the surrounding political circumstances are not so supportive. North Korea's isolation is ever deepening due to the recent cyber attack against Sony Pictures on top of nuclear weapons and human rights problems. President Obama even said in a recent interview that the North Korean regime will eventually collapse. North Korea is perhaps facing the worst times since the launch of the Kim Jong-un regime. The situations surrounding the Korean Peninsula is not favorable either. The three core countries in Northeast Asia Korea, China, and Japan were not able to hold the trilateral summit for three years now due to the history and territorial conflicts. Nevertheless, we know that great crises sometimes come with great opportunities. If history is any reminder for, US, for us, unification will come in an unexpected manner and moment rather than in, in a pre predictable fashion. 
2015 can be a year of dialogue and reconciliation that brings about stability on the Korean Peninsula and the surrounding situation. Or it can be another unfortunate year of confrontation and division and continued struggles with the vestiges of the Cold War. This year will indeed stand at the historic crossroad. In this light, we are at times where the US, perhaps having the biggest stake in Northeast Asian politics and the Korean unification, has important roles to play. The purpose of today's symposium would be to share frank opinions and enhance mutual understanding over such array of issues. So in closing, it is my sincere hope that the symposium today will provide an opportunity to share insights and wisdom on the Korean Peninsula related issues. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ambassador Shin. Uh, and now to offer some congratulatory remarks uh, is uh, Ambassador An Ho Young. Ambassador An, stage is yours. Thank you. Good afternoon. No response. Good afternoon. Well, as a matter of fact, it well. Some of my colleagues coming from Korea, they flew 14 hours, and there is 14 hour time lag between Seoul and Washington. So what time is it? This is 3.30 in the morning. <laughs> so they need you to cheer, cheer them up a little bit. So good afternoon, <laughs> right? So thank you so much. I came to Washington this time as an ambassador in 2013. But the first time when I came to Washington, that was back in 1981. Second time in 1990. Third time in 2005. So this is my first time to come and live in Washington, D.C. In other words, I've been coming to Washington every decade for the past four decades. Isn't it amazing, right? When I say that, many of you ask me, well, you must have seen a lot of changes in Washington, D.C. for the past four decades. And you must have seen a lot of changes in the relationship between Korea and United States. And then, in fact, I did. I saw a lot of changes, and I have to tell you, most of them, or all of them, were made in a very, very positive direction. So this afternoon, Welcoming my friends coming from Korea, let me try to uh, share with you at least three of them, right? So first positive change I came to notice for the past four decades, that is, the forgotten war has changed itself into a forgotten victory. In the United States, the Korean War, which was fought between 1950 and 1953, it was known as you know, know it already, as a forgotten war. That was up until 2013. 2013, I came here as an ambassador, and it just happened to be the 60th anniversary of the end of Korean War hostilities, as well as 60th anniversary of mutual security treaty between Korea and United States. And 2013 was the first year when I heard you, American citizens, referring to the Korean War as a forgotten victory. When I first heard it, I was really, really touched by the fact that Korean War is now being addressed as a forgotten victory in this country. Because what's the difference between forgotten war and forgotten victory? On the surface, the difference is just one word, war and victory. But at the same time, if you look into the, the, the underlying basis between the two, then the difference is huge. So when you say forgotten war, what would be the underlying emotion? The underlying emotion would be frustration. Frustration in the sense we came to Korea, a country we never heard of. We lost tens of thousands of lives. 
we came back, and nobody even remember that we, put, we fought a war in Korea. So when you say forgotten war, the underlying emotion is one of frustration. But what about forgotten victory? What is the underlying emotion when you say forgotten victory? We went to fight in a far off country. We never even heard of the name Korea. We lost tens of thousands of lives. After 60 years, what is happening in the country? Economy is booming. Democracy is a model democracy, especially in Asia. And Korea has found its place in the international community. I'm so proud. I'm so proud of what is happening in Korea. I'm so proud about what I did for the country 60 years ago. So when you say forgotten victory, that would be the underlying emotion. So that is the reason why I say between forgotten war and forgotten victory, it took no less than 60 years for forgotten war to change itself into forgotten victory. So, so there is the very positive change I came to notice in this town. The second very positive change would be Korean cuisine. How many of you had Korean food uh, for today? <laughs> Korean cuisine has found this place in the mainstream American society. Why do I say that? It's because as an ambassador, I meet a large number of people here in Washington, D.C. I meet senators, I meet congressmen, I meet uh, government officials like Song Kim, where are you? Song Kim, and then I meet academics, I meet journalists, and then many of them, they ask me, well, please recommend to me a good Korean restaurant in town, right? Where is the good Korean restaurant in town? When I hear that, what do I say? I say, the best Korean restaurant in town, that is my kitchen in my residence, right? <laughs> and then I say, I'm sorry I cannot invite you today, right? So the second best restaurant would be, uh, you will have to go to, be Anna, go to Anandale, right? But at the same time, that's a joke, but when I hear it, I in fact, my heart is filled with a lot of pride. Why? Because what is food? Clothing you put on the outside of your body, right? Cosmetic you apply on the outside of your, of your face. What about food? That's something you take and put to in, in, <laughs> into yourself, into your stomach, right? So if you do not feel comfortable about the country, if you do not feel comfortable about the culture, or if you do not feel comfortable about the people coming from the country, then you wouldn't feel like having the food, right? So that is the reason why, in my mind, this is a very positive change. So many American citizens ask me, where can I find a good Korean restaurant? My third very positive change I came to notice in this town is proliferation, quote-unquote proliferation, of Korea chairs in uh, think tanks in town. It started with the CSIS. And just in front of me, I have Victor Cha. And when I call him the dean of Korean studies in town, the dean of Korean studies in, what, in the United States of America, none of you would object to me. Would you? Victor Cha, he is the Dean of Korean Studies in the whole United States of America. And what he, he, is he doing? He's a chair, Korean chair, at the CSIS. And what is CSIS? Well, if you go to University of Pennsylvania, they have something called Think Tank Institute. Year after year after year, they choose CSIS as the best think tank in the United States and in the whole world in the area of international and foreign studies security studies. So, so that's CSIS. And Victor Cha is the Korea chair. And then we have Korea chair at the Brookings Institution. We have something similar at the uh, Woodrow Wilson Center. And then I know there are many other think tanks, top quality think tanks, which want to have Korea chair, right? It means a lot to me. Why? Because think about Washington, D.C. I think there are two important groups of people in Washington, D.C. On the one hand, decision makers, like Song Kim, or like Ambassador Amitaj, right? On the other hand, they're opinion makers. 
everybody else, right? And then I think this is the town where the relationship between decision makers and opinion makers, I think it's a very, very close relationship you, you have in this town. So having Korea chairs at the CSIS, having Korea chair at the Brookings Institution, having Korea chair at Woodrow Wilson Center, that in fact means a lot for the relationship between Korea and the United States. So I've already shared with you the three very, very positive changes. I could go on for many hours, but at the same time, uh, I should be stopping by here. But at the same time, what, are, what is the meaning of all these positive changes we are observing? And then I've just tried to share with you. Well, in a sense, they are reflections of strengthening relations between Korea and the United, and then the United States. But at the same time, they in fact, I mean, all those positive changes in fact, they in fact will work to further strengthen the relations between Korea and United States for the coming 60 years. But at the same time, let me try to wrap up with a word or with a message which, with which all of you would be able to agree with, which is complacency is the last thing we want. Complacency is something we should be avoiding. In other words, we just have to continue to ask ourselves what worked between our two countries. And then we have to continue to ask ourselves what we will have to do in the days to come in order to further strengthen relations between Korea and United States. And that, I think, is the reason why I'm so encouraged about this seminar you're having today. And who do you have on the panel? I should be very careful about it in the sense that I should be behaving myself in a, in a, in a sense, in the sense that well, we have four panelists, Deputy Prime Minister Hyun Oseok, and Ambassador Choi Young Jin, they in fact used to be my bosses. They are my former bosses, you see. And then we have Ambassador Amitaj and Ambassador Sung Kim, who are my boss today, right? <laughs> and they are, say, my bosses of yesterday or today, but at the same time, they in fact are the most qualified uh, panelists we could ever get hold of in order to discuss the issue we have at hand today, which is the relations between Korea and United States. So thank you so much, and then let us try to enjoy the panel discussion this afternoon. Thank you. Um, well, thank you, Ambassador Ahn and Ambassador Shin, for those remarks. Um, today is a conversation on Korea and the United States. Um, uh, CSIS is uh, doing this in cooperation with the Institute for Foreign Affairs and National Security. Uh, and we're grateful to our Korean friends and partners uh, for doing our meeting yesterday and then the public symposium today. Uh, we also benefit in this, this symposium from the support of uh, Samsung Electronics America in their support of our Korea platform events, so we're grateful to them as well. Um, <clears throat> um, the, uh, there's a lot to talk about, and um, I thought where we begin is uh, to pick up with um, some of Ambassador Shin's opening remarks in terms of the question of uh, unification. Um, President Park has uh, been quite vocal on the issue of unification. President Obama, um, uh, I believe, stated in the last summit that he saw her ideas about Seoul peace process and other things fitting well with the rebalance or pivot to Asia. Um, uh, so perhaps we should begin by, um, I would like to ask uh, Deputy Prime Minister Hyun um, if he could offer some remarks on what you think are the, the, the origins, what is the basis of President Park's so-called uh, unification strategy, referring to it as a, a, a jackpot, if you will, of sorts. 
Okay, thank you, uh, Dr. Um, I think, first of all, uh, I'd like to express my deep appreciation to you and that, uh, President Shin of high funds in Korea uh, allowing me uh, this valuable uh, discussion. And, uh, just I mean that uh, there's a saying that uh, uh, if you want to be happy, that once you out of office, then you'll better to overcome what I was complex. <laughs> so, but this time, so I'm, I'm just uh, trying to make my personal view rather than representing the Korean government. Okay. So, as for the uh, unification issues is concerned, uh, as uh, the uh, President Shin already mentioned in the in his uh, opening remarks, that uh, this year I think will mark the 70th anniversary of the uh, division. Uh, actually, that. Uh, um, I think most Korean people that uh, felt uh, a sense of mission because Korea uh, remains the only country so divided uh, since World War II. Uh, so uh, uh, in that sense, I think that unification is quite important issues uh, as far as uh, Korea's uh, uh, conversation agenda is concerned. And in addition, over 90% of Korean population were born after the Korean War. So I think uh, most Korean people are agree that uh, the need for unification, but uh, they, so frankly speaking, some of them are wary of the cost of pains uh, in the process of unification. In that sense, I think uh, uh, President Park's uh, unification policies uh, have several implications, at least three implications, okay? So the first implication is, uh, uh, I think uh, her unification policies uh, I think is an attempt at the re-engineering of the discourse uh, over unification uh, for the past. I mean, from that uh, something uh, I mean, to be dark and then negative to uh, the bright and then positive ones. Uh, so uh, as you mentioned that uh, uh, already, the unification might be interpreted as, uh, as bonanza. I'd like to avoid that uh, jackpot, it's some connotation problem, but, but anyway. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so uh, that means that uh, unification uh, might provide a huge uh, benefits and opportunities, not only for Korea, and, but also in the world. Um, just, um, just, uh, I just uh, enumerated a couple of things. I mean, the unified Korea will be a herald of peace and booster of growth and land of uh, freedom and democracy, and the defect of human rights. And also, uh, I mean, there are several uh, security issues also might be uh, counted as, a, as, as benefit. Okay. So definitely, uh, some division of Korea will be geopolitical cause, but uh, unified Korea will be the geopolitical source of prosperity. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so that's the first implication. And second implication is that uh, I think we need to prepare for the unification through a more practical approach rather than ideological ones. So uh, to make uh, the today's vision uh, uh, tomorrow's uh, uh, the realities, I think we must begin. So it's a very uh, um, meticulous of the preparation uh, from now. So that's why that uh, uh, I think that the uh, Korean government already established the, 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 the preparatory unification. I mean, that the uh, committee is under uh, President Park, OK? Uh, so and the, the way to reach the unification is, 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 is not just the one, one time. It's a very, very paced and a gradual and a functional approach in that sense. Okay? So uh, I think, uh, as already uh, uh, President Shin mentioned, that uh, President Park that, uh, that uh, proposed that uh, uh, the three-pointed agenda in a speech in, in Dresden of Germany, uh, um, such as that uh, agenda for humanity, agenda for uh, co-prosperity, and agenda for the integration. Okay, that's the I mean, second I mean, the implication. The final, the third implication is that I think it's in, in relation to unification, I think uh, we have to create a right 
international environment conducive to that uh, unification. Okay, that might be the core of that uh, uh, President Park's unification policy. So uh, that means that Korea's North uh, East Asia policies cannot be that uh, decoupled from the unification. Mm -hmm. So that means that uh, such as that uh, Korea's uh, uh, North East uh, Asia, uh, North East Asia Peace and then Cooperation Initiatives and Eurasian Initiatives might contribute to bring about North Korea's changes. Okay, so that that those kind of implications uh, might be uh, include uh, in my, my interpretation in the President Park's uh, unification policy. Let me stop here. Well, thank you, um, Prime Minister Hyun. Uh, ambassador Che Che Young Jin, you you were ambassador here. Um, during the early part of President Park's uh, term in office. Um, I'd like to ask you the same question, but going a little bit further, uh, I mean, you've had lots of experience in uh, ROK government serving in different posts, serving many presidents. Do you find that her uh, the, uh, unification policy or strategy as Deputy Prime Minister Yuhan laid out is different from things you've seen in the past? Are there things about it that you feel are different or unique? Uh, in the way she thinks about unification? Um, the approach towards North Korea has been central theme for all the presidencies in Korea. And it's an evolving process. And we have tested all sorts of possible formulas. Uh, sunshine policy, confrontation, uh, brinkmanship, and some in meetings, everything. But it didn't really produce tangible results. So what Madame Bach is trying to do is, without confidence, really we can not make meaningful progress. So that's what she is aiming at. Having said this, uh, unlike German's case, uh, a lot depends on, unfortunately, on North Korea, not us, neither South Korea nor the United States. Because North Korea is a completely isolated country with autarkic economy. That means we do not have much leverage. And on top of this, North Korea, the best description is North Korea is in mortal dilemma. On the one hand, what North Korea is doing is pursuing what the Soviet Union did exactly by words, word by word, sacrifice the, the life of the population, starving them, and shift all the resources to military capabilities increase. And Pyongyang knows that it cannot possibly work. So it will increase the internal contradictions which will lead the regime to, to collapse. So what North Korea has, the other option is what I call Chinese option, which is make a strategic decision and embark on the road of opening and reform. In other words, introduction of the market economy. Accept trade and investment and engage with foreign countries, not in military uh, negotiations, but in economic exchange. But that is fraught with dangers for the regime because it is completely control the economy. If you let the population taste the liberty, the regime is not sure whether they might survive. So one way or the other, there is a great danger for the regime. So what North Korea is now pursuing, it is called a two-track approach or simultaneous advancement, that is nuclear weapons and, and trade, which is only the expression of this dilemma. It cannot possibly work. So sooner or later, North Korea must make a choice whether it can, even though there is a danger, it can exp experiment Chinese option. Otherwise, a lot of hesitations, ambiguities, North Korea will go down to the path of Soviet Union. So whatever happens, the unification will be on South Korea's term because North Korea is a burden, not a prey anymore. So only South Korea can, can 
uh, take up enormous burden of raising the li livelihood of North Korean population. In that case, what it means to Korea is we will have market economy, democratic country on the entire, entire Korean Peninsula, nuclear weapons free, and th that means South Korea an additional 25 million highly skilled workers, labor forces. That is what they call jackpot or bonanza. And they are highly qualified. And remember only 20 some years ago, China and North Korea were on a par, they are same economically. And only 30 something years ago, South and North Korea were not quite different. So that means, given opportunity, North Korean people can make enormous, miraculous economic development, like South Korea, like China. So I see the, the chances, but the, the road to drive to that opportunity, the bonanza, uh, will be unpredictable because a lot depends on North Korea, not on us. Right, thank you. Um, Rich Armitage. Um, Ambassador An said that he had all his bosses up here. I really do have my boss up here because he's a CSIS trustee. So, <laughs> Rich Armitage, former Deputy Secretary of State. Um, um, you know, not to be impolite in this room, but there's always this discourse in parts of Korea or parts of Asia that somehow the United States is not in favor of Korean unification. And I'd like to get your response to that. I mean, what the other nations in Asia? The other nations in Asia, including the United States, their views on unification. Well, thank you, uh, Professor Chow. I think, as direct answer to your question, as a general matter, reunification of the peninsula under Seoul's leadership uh, is a good outcome and a desirable outcome, with some caveats. Uh, the caveats, I think, are quite obvious. Uh, first of all, for uh, the United States, and I, I think for Japan, if a united Peninsula of Korea is in the main directed in their economic interest and their political interest toward uh, the People's Republic of China. This may be a source of some concern uh, for the United States and others. If, on the other hand, the United Peninsula of Korea is very Western oriented and looking outward, uh, this would be, I think, something that would be viewed most favorably and positively. Likewise, the future Peninsula of Korea, if it uh, if uh, U.S. forces were still invited by the people of Korea uh, to participate in some manner, that might be of a concern uh, to China. All of those are manageable. But it's, as I say, after having said, it's generally a favorable situation. Uh, the manner in which reunification is accomplished and the direction of the politics from Seoul after that uh, will dictate a lot of the response. But as a general matter, people who are not in favor of reunification are greatly in the minority from my point of view. Great, thanks. Um, uh, Sung Kim, um, Deputy Assistant Secretary of State and Special Envoy for North Korea, former U.S. Ambassador to Korea, thanks for joining us um, today. Um, um, so we've heard from Rich generally about uh, how different countries in the region feel. I mean, from the perspective of the Obama administration, I think President Obama was I'm the first to say that um, he supports a Korea whole and free. Um, um, could you tell us um, something about sort of how, what, what the administration's views are on Hakone's unification bonanza, the Seoul peace process, uh, Northeast Asian peace and security uh, forum? Sure, thanks very much. But before I answer your question, can I make three points? See, I, uh, I always follow Ambassador An's lead, and you notice that he always has three points, no matter what this is. <laughs> three points. First, I apologize for being a little late, uh, but uh, Chris Nelson, it's not because I was conducting some secret diplomacy. <laughs> There's something much more ominous than that, Washington traffic. <laughs> uh, secondly, uh, I want to echo what Ambassador Han said about my fellow panelists. I mean, this is, uh, I'm deeply honored to be on the stage with uh, Deputy Secretary Armitage, Deputy Prime Minister Hyun, and Ambassador Che. Uh, Deputy Prime Minister Hyun was enormously helpful in our efforts to implement the historic free trade agreement. Uh, it was a very, very strong partner, so thank you. Uh, and Rich is, of course, boss to many, many people, including me. I still remember I was a very junior political officer in Tokyo when um, Secretary Armitage visited. I was so scared 
I wouldn't even sit down in his suite. <laughs> and he said, just sit down. <laughs> this belongs to the American people. <laughs> uh, and Ambassador Che uh, represents the finest of the Korean diplomatic corps. I, I really think Korea has some of the most talented diplomats, and he's one of them. So I'm thrilled to be with uh, all of you here. Um, and finally, point three is thanks to Victor and CSIs for organizing this forum. Um, Initially, I think Victor told me that this would be a very safe forum about U.S.-Korea alliance. So I thought, great, I'm sure I'd be happy to participate. But then somehow over the past few days, it's evolved into something that's <laughs> focused on reunification. Uh, but still, I'm happy to be here. Too. Uh, I think our uh, answer on uh, the question of unification is quite straightforward and simple. Uh, the president has made this very clear. We very strongly support President Park's vision for unification. We strongly support uh, the Korean government's efforts to um, engage the North Koreans in some meaningful and constructive dialogue to talk about not just issues between the two Koreas, uh, but to talk about how we can all work together towards the common goal of denuclearization. So um, absolutely no qualification. We very strongly support uh, President Park's efforts and vision. Um, great, that's, that's very straightforward. Um, let me ask you about another issue, and it is related to the alliance. I promise we'll talk about the alliance, but it's related to the alliance. And there's um, uh, some perceptions in this town and among the chattering classes out there, the so-called opinion makers that Ambassador Ahn referred to, that um, the growing engagement between President Park and Xi Jinping um, on the economic side, on terms of the security side, is, is somehow reflecting Korea drifting in the direction of China and away from uh, the sort of conventional U.S.-Japan relationship. Um, how, how would you respond to that, Prime Minister Hyun? Well, uh, maybe. Um, in, in my view, I think that uh, some relations, some bilateral relations cannot be the zero sum game. Uh -huh. in, in, in other words, I mean, Korea, I think, I mean, should pursue in both. I mean, that uh, relation with the U.S. and also the, some, some kind of a uh, very uh, um, a close relation with, with China too. Mm -hmm. but, uh, but, but recent, I think that uh, uh, some kind of a, uh, access to China it's not shifted from the U.S. I, I want to interpret it. In some sense, uh, try to uh, find out uh, some kind of uh, equities in the uh, Korea-China relations, and more than the more equities uh, compared to the previous years. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so uh, this is my interpretation. In, in other words, I mean, this is not uh, something like away from U.S. Uh, just about to cross to China. It's, it's, it's a, a kind of a strategy so from the Korea's point of view. And another thing is that um, actually that China is, is, is very much close uh, in, the, uh, in the general the unification or some denuclearization policy is so mm -hmm. concerned. Uh, but uh, I think that uh, North Korea is, has uh, I mean, continuously proclaimed the so-called Byongjin policies, and in other words, um, something like they argue that uh, I mean, simultaneously development, the nuclearization and then economy uh, issues. But uh, I mean, you cannot have a cake and eat too, so mm -hmm. it, it, it doesn't work. So I think uh, uh, in that sense, I think, uh, I mean, North Korea, I think, uh, should take more seriously where their economy is going on. In other words, I mean, uh, they should take uh, I mean, some kind of reforms, not so much uh, satisfactory, but uh, they should start. I mean, I mean, I mean just uh, the following that uh, Chinese case or Vietnamese case, but uh, they start anyway, unless it's really hard I mean, to deal with that uh, uh, international context. Mm -hmm. Rich, Rich, what about this question of Korea drifting in your uh, conversations with people in the region. Professor Chow, on, on this issue, there are always some of the chattering classes who are going to uh, look for trouble when it doesn't exist uh, and make allegations that uh, 
Mrs. Park wants to, uh, to trade one relationship for another. I, for one, don't buy it. Don't buy it for a minute. I mean, there are obviously there are economic uh, dimensions of a uh, Republic of Korea-China relationship. It's undeniable. I read yesterday in the newspaper there are one in three tourists uh, to Republic of Korea from China. So you can't deny an economic interest. Uh, but I think her activities with President Xi Jinping in the main are devoted to trying to resolve the North Korean puzzle, the North Korean question, and trying to get China finally to stand up and use what influence China does have in a, in a very positive way. Um, and I think the reason she can do this is because she has confidence that the United States is going to be there for, that we do believe in this relationship. Uh, but Ambassador Ahn, in his opening remarks, made some comments about needing to guard against complacency. And if the uh, relationship between the Republic of Korea and uh, People's Republic of China keeps us from being complacent, that's a good thing. Mm -hmm. But I don't buy the argument of the chattering some of the chattering classes. Unless, at all. But, but, but Rich, what about in Japan? What's the view in Japan? What would you say the view in What Japan? is the view in Japan? Yeah, yeah. Uh, as I talk to Japanese friends, they are somewhat more skeptical uh, about uh, the uh, motives uh, of uh, the government uh, of Korea. Not totally skeptical, uh, but somewhat more skeptical. Uh, and I've noticed in recent months, um, as the relationship between China and Japan has slightly bettered, uh, that that sort of criticism has dropped down a bit. Mm -hmm. right. um, and so we're very fortunate to have two former ambassadors on stage here, Sung Ambassador for the United States to Korea, Ambassador Che, Ambassador of Korea to the United States. Um, so let me ask you on the alliance, um, sort of um, one question is with regard to uh, TPP. And there seems to be uh, a new momentum to TPP now. The president in the State of the Union speech explicitly talked about TPA and TPP. Um, how should the US ROK alliance be thinking about uh, TPP and, and its future? So, uh, Ambassador Chet? We have a chorus, in other words, Korea US free trade agreement, uh, which is by far uh, the most highly. Uh, uh, and the highest level of liberalization between two countries in terms of trade. So TPP is an additional uh, instrument in our hands to reinforce the relationship. And I don't think why Korea should not join TPP. It's only a matter of timing. And on the other hand, uh, your previous question was very important. Is Korea leaning towards China? We have the other issue, counterpart of TPP, that is AIIB, Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, proposed by China. So in the end, I think Korea should join both of them. And uh, in this sense, I do not see any problem. Uh, TPP possibly may cause to Korea. Having said this, let me briefly respond to your important question. Sure. Korea leading for China. It is not correct. It's not, it's factually correct. But also it does not make any sense for all the three countries involved. The misgivings, I think, arise from the trade volume really too much, too rapidly increasing between two countries, Korea and China. 20 years ago, when he established relations between two countries, it was almost zero. Last year, it was increased to $250 billion. On the other hand, Korea US remained at the level of $100 billion, so two and a half times more. And this may give you, is Korea leaning towards uh, China is a natural course for the future. That is only trade. Don't forget that Korea-US is a military alliance. It cannot be compared to a simple com commercial relationship with China. And more than that, just remember, imagine what will happen to this important area for the entire world. What happens if there is no presence of the United States, America? And it will be very chaotic, very even dangerous. 
And from America's interest, uh, as the, the uh, policy pivot to Asia uh, proves, America has every interest to be engaged in this important area, East Asia, the future engine of world economy, global economy. And Korea-US alliance is one of the people most important. So it makes sense for Korea and America to maintain this alliance. Secondly, for China, I really don't think if Korea aligns completely China, that would please China and serve to the interest of China. It's better for us, Korea, to maintain the relations with America and serve as a link between East and West and for the benefit of everybody. So leaning towards China is not only correct, but does not make any sense. Korea will maintain alliance with the United States as long as Washington wants it. Korea will increase its cooperative relations with China. Uh, naturally, it happens. And we don't see any contradiction. As long as we say China not, is not, uh, they are not on the collision course, and I don't believe it. There will be competition, but I don't think confrontation is in the card. So as long as that is discarded, uh, Korea's maintaining alliance with the US and Korea's increasing corporate relations with China is not contradiction. It's totally, absolutely feasible and to the interest of everybody involved. Yeah, thanks. Um, Sang, um, you, are, um, you hold, wear two hats now, and in your hat as a Deputy Assistant Secretary, uh, you have both Japan and Korea under your, under your um, AOR, if you will. Um, so um, could I ask you, what is sort of the state of the trilateral relationship right now? I know that uh, you've just come back from trilateral talks. Um, if you could say in, in this role that you have now, of keeping all of our allies on the same page, uh, how's that going, basically? Um, first of all, as you know, the, the trilateral cooperation and coordination among the U.S., uh, Korea, and Japan is critical to not only U.S.'s interests, but for regional peace and stability. And this is why we take it so seriously. Mm -hmm. And this is why we work hard with both Korean friends and Japanese friends to try to strengthen that trilateral cooperation. I'm um, just in terms of my sort of recent dealings, as you mentioned, I was in Tokyo last week for North Korea policy coordination among the three countries. And I can report confidently that uh, our coordination could not be better. I think on every major aspect, uh, there's very strong agreement among the three countries, uh, both in sort of assessing the current situation, um, reviewing recent developments, including the cyber attack against Sony, um, but more important, looking forward on terms of next steps and what we can do together to try to resume credible negotiations on the acquisition. I think we're on the same page. Uh, and if you look at, uh, if you go back a little bit further, you know, we signed a MOU on information sharing among the three countries, which again, I think is an important develop, positive development among the three countries that it will help strengthen trilateral cooperation. Obviously, uh, Japan and Korea uh, have some difficult issues between them. Uh, I think both countries are committed to making a real effort to resolve uh, some of those issues, including the painful comfort woman issue. I think as a strong friend and ally to both countries, we you know, encourage both Seoul and Tokyo to, to work harder uh, to try to address some of the issues between them. But I think overall, there's very strong recognition that trilateral cooperation is important and that three of us need to continue to work at it. Mm -hmm. Victor, can I just uh, go back to you a couple of yes, questions? Please. Uh, on China, Korea, um, I agree with everything Rich and Ambassador Chess said, and I think that, that is the administration's perspective as well. Um, I would, in fact, go one step further and say, not only are we not worried about uh, Korea-China relations, but we've, in fact, it, we think it's a good thing that Korea and China are improving relations. It's a good thing that China uh, is having constructive and robust relations with democratic country that believes in human rights, uh, free market principles, et cetera. I think th that type of influence will uh, be good for all of us. Mm -hmm. But let me ask you then, but um, Rich said there is a little bit of concern in Japan among some. I mean, how, how, do we, how is that addressed? But I think, you know, my sense is that part of that concern may be because uh, Japan and Korea relations 
probably are not as smooth as it could be. Mm. Uh, but I'm confident that you know, these two great countries will be able to find a way back to a much more constructive, uh, fuller relationship. Mm. And when that happens, I think concerns about Korea-China relations will probably uh, diminish quite a mm. bit. Okay. And do you want to say anything on TPP? Sure. Um, and, uh, as you know, we welcome Korea's interest uh, in joining TPP. Um, we think it would make a lot of sense. And as Ambassador Che pointed out, we have in the U.S. Korea Free Trade Agreement, uh, what we call the gold standard free trade agreement. Uh, it's a wonderful agreement. Uh, so it really would not be much of an effort for Korea to meet sort of the additional standards that would come with TPP. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just, just, yes. just, just, I would like to add a TPP. So. Yes. I, think, I think TPP is a very, very important in the, in the two respect for the United States. Mm. Number one is that uh, I think that uh, TPP is some kind of a reflection of a so-called rebalancing Asia policies of the United States. And another one is that uh, once uh, the TPP is not concluded smoothly, I think the U.S. leadership might be seriously affected. I mean, if you consider the, the Chinese I mean, that, uh, uh, emergency in the uh, Northeast Asia, so, I mean, including RCEP, so uh, some kind of, so DPP, I mean, should be concluded as we schedule. As far as Korea is concerned, I, I think uh, Korea should join DPP I mean, sooner or later. I mean, depending upon the, the schedule of the TPPs for the original members. But uh, in the case of Korea, I mean, among that, uh, I think 12 countries of uh, TPPs, only two countries, Korea, did not have free trade agreement. One is Mexico, another is Japan. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that means most of the members of the TPP original uh, I mean, that, uh, schemes Korea had already reached their own. So they might have some time for the joint TPP in the, in the practical sense. Mm. Thank you. Mm. Right. Rich, do you have a view on TPP? Other, no. than, other than it should be done, yeah. right? I'm for it. <laughs> right, I'm for it. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, then let's turn to, uh, we talked a little bit about it during the unification question, but let's turn to North Korea if we could. Um, um, so since um, the start of the new year, we've seen lots of different things by the, the North Koreans, the, uh, dropping the hint of a possible summit, um, the accepting this invitation to go to Moscow in May, um, uh, um, uh, talking at least to the press about their interest in uh, uh, inviting U.S. officials to North Korea. Where do you think we, I mean, what do you think all this means? What, what are the... Is this a strategic decision by the North Koreans, or is it tactical? Prime Minister Hyun, what do you think is going on here? Well, I, I think it, it is quite well known that uh, uh, North Korea's behavior is like a roller coaster ride, right? It's very unpredictable, but uh, especially that, uh, uh, I mean, very un unpredictable since that uh, the third uh, the nuclear test, okay, that might trigger the, the, the very uh, top stable uh, international sanctions. Okay. Mm -hmm. But uh, but let me let me that uh, call your attention to the North Korean economy. So when we interpret uh, their proposal, so, so as I mentioned already, some kind of Beijing I mean might not work. I mean even though North Korea I mean mentioned that uh, they are adopted a couple of market oriented policies. Uh, like um, I mean, they uh, designate some economic zone and then provide uh, some kind of favorable terms to foreign investors and tourists. And also uh, uh, they allow that uh, uh, some agricultural people to own that some 30% of production, something like that. Mm -hmm. But I mean, uh, Kim Jong-un's behavior is, is really I mean, that, uh, uh, very unpredictable. So, those kind of policies that cannot rule any, any foreign investment, something like that. So I think uh, we might interpret that uh, some kind of proposal I mean, for the, the cemetery might be a sign that 
those policies is failing. So that means that uh, due to that uh, some kind of difficulties of uh, economies, they might uh, uh, try to find out uh, new ways, mm -hmm. uh, like uh, a proposal to a or something like that. But, uh, and uh, also, uh, I, I read in the newspaper, President Park that uh, mentioned that she would like to uh, meet uh, without uh, precondition. But we have to be very careful that uh, uh, does meet without precondition does not mean that some kind of unconditional engagement. So the meeting without precondition is, 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 is one thing to test the real condition of North Korea. But uh, as I, uh, we talked already, uh, President Park's unification policy is very consistent. In other words, I mean, that, uh, its bottom line is that I mean, denuclearization, et cetera. Like that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks. Rich, um, so what do you think is going on here? And then also if you could say something about where you think uh, the discussion between Japan and North Korea is and what, which, be, first, where, what do you think is behind all these North Korean overtures? And then secondly, if you could say something about Japan, North Korea, and their relationship. Japan, North Korea. Yes. yes. <clears throat> first of all, I, I would have said, in answer to the question of strategic versus tactical, that during the time of Kim Il-sung, it was somewhat more strategic. But since the mid-90s, somewhat after the framework agreement, I think it's been increasingly tactical. Mm. And now, I would say it's totally tactical, mm. cynical, oozing insincerity from North Korea. Uh, even the recent published, or at least reported upon, uh, memoirs of former President Lee myung bak makes it quite clear that the Koreans, North Koreans were, of course, interested in the summit for a certain amount of money. So uh, I don't think we can overstate their cynicism. On, on the question of uh, Japan and North Korea, uh, this is, for the second time, uh, Japan has been intent on having discussions with uh, the North Koreans on the question of uh, abductees. During Prime Minister Koizumi's uh, time in office, he had these discussions as well. Uh, it appears that the North Koreans have lost interest uh, for the most part in this. Uh, from my point of view, I may be misinformed, but uh, the Japanese wanted some deliverance. Mm. They wanted information. And uh, the North Koreans, they just wanted something, money or aid or something of that nature, without having to come up with any admission of guilt or anything of that nature. So I, I find those things are completely stalled. There were some here in the United States that were worried for a while that Japan might be playing a game with North Korea uh, that was really directed against the Republic of Korea. I don't find that to be the case. Uh, in discussions with Japanese officials, I've never heard anybody indicate that, but I've seen it written about the press. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Sung, I mean, what do you, where do you think we are on this? I mean, what is behind these North Korean overtures? Um, uh, you know, are they, is there meaning to them? Do you see anything useful in them? Um, our sense is that North Koreans, wherever they go, whether it's their overtures in Europe, Southeast Asia, Africa, um, they're hearing a very consistent message from all of these countries, and that is that unless they make progress on the nuclear issue, and unless they start to live up to their obligations and commitments, um, and follow um, you know, UN Security Council resolution requirements, that um, they will not be able to improve relations with anybody. And I think that's a fairly consistent and important message that they're hearing um, in their diplomatic outreach effort. Um, and I think that is going to continue. I don't see any of uh, our friends in Europe, or Southeast Asia, anywhere um, compromising on that very important principle. Because mm -hmm. we all share a very serious concern about North Korea's pursuit of dangerous weapons programs, both nuclear and missiles. And so they, unless they may start to work with us uh, on some meaningful progress in that regard, I don't think they will see much success in their diplomatic outreach. Mm -hmm. But Japan, uh, North Korea, yeah. It, as Rich points out, I think there, there may have been some concern uh, initially, but uh, basically we support Japan's efforts to deal with this very important humanitarian issue of the abductees. Um, so we are very comfortable uh, with uh, Japan-North Korea dialogue focused on how they can make progress on that important issue. Mm -hmm. Then 
how do we explain Russia? <laughs> if the message that they're getting, the North Koreans are getting all over is you can't improve with anybody <laughs> until you denuclearize, what, maybe the Russians didn't get the message or something. Russia and North Korea, we have to put it into perspective. And I agree with Ambassador Sung Kim that I don't see much diplomacy on the part of North Korea. I can see only expressions of their dilemma, expressions of their, their ambiguities. In other words, uh, what North Korea can really do is show outside world, South Korea, Japan, China, United States, that I made up my mind. In other words, I want to join you. Then everything will be so easy, corporations, investment. But as long as North Korea does not make such a strategic decision, it will be always in dilemma. And uh, overtures will be half-hearted. And all the cooperation initiatives we'll be presenting to them will be seen as Trojan horse of poisoned carrot. So that's, that's not because we really poison it, but from on their part, however good intention we, we with good intention we propose cooperation exchanges, they will be seen as Trojan horse because of the characteristics of the regime. And how do we see whether they made a strategic decision? There is only one criteria, that is China case again. Early Deng Xiaoping regime is just like North Koreans. They want to control everything, even for investment. And the, the workforces was provided by the state. And what made Deng Xiaoping's decision important was he realized it would lead nowhere, Chinese economy, as long as we do not allow economic freedom to individuals, there will be no market economy, there will be no economic development. So what, what Deng Xiaoping did in mid 80s, I will allow the Chinese citizens living in this special economic zone to be employed freely, individually, and receive salaries individually, and spend them as they fit. That made what China is today. So as long as North Korea, I've, I don't think nobody has seen yet the Pyongyang regime allowed not a single citizen to be employed freely by foreign company or by foreign embassy. So as long as we do not see such a move, I don't see any meaning, uh, meaningful gesture in North Korea uh, which can uh, be of interest to us. So as long as North Korea does not make strategic decision, I don't see any, any gesture on their part, including North Korea, Russia, uh, theatrics, I don't attach any, any meaning for uh, uh, significance for the future. And remember, last comment, Russia, North Korea, they always made a, a point when they, they were in difficulty and all the other things did not work. So now everything is frozen for, for North Korea, and Russia is in difficulty. So they may come up with uh, some, some uh, interesting uh, diplomatic uh, moves, but will it have meaningful uh, bearings for the future? Mm. As long as North Korea does not make strategic decision, I don't see any, any really meaningful uh, mm. prospect for the future progress. Mm. Okay. Dr. Can I add? Um, yes, please. So. I think it's worth noting that um, Russians, even though they are having some senior level contact with the North Koreans, at every opportunity, senior Russian government officials have made clear that they remain committed to the joint statement of the six party process, that they want to work with uh, the six party process towards complete denuclearization of North Korea, uh, and that in fact they would strongly oppose uh, a nuclear test by North Korea. Yeah. So um, I, I think I agree with Ambassador Che that there would be a limit to what the two countries can do. Yeah unless North Koreans actually start to address our common concerns. Mm -hmm. Rich? On Russia, though, obviously, uh, historically, well, Russia is a Eurasian landmass, but its interests have been directed more to the former, historically, than the latter. Uh, I think because of the difficulties right now in Crimea, Eastern Ukraine, and uh, the difficulties between Russia and the uh, European Union, uh, that Russia is looking to be relevant somewhere. Uh, that's part of it and they had a very bad one-sided energy deal with China recently and 
Now, as you indicated earlier, Professor Cha, uh, an invitation apparently to uh, Kim Jong-un to go to Moscow. I think what the Russians are doing are sending a signal that they can cause difficulties in other parts of the world if they choose in order to try to get Europe and the, and the West to lighten up on sanctions regime. But I, I did not put that past the Russian Federation. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Um, okay, so we have some time left, and uh, I promised that we'd have some questions from the audience. Um, so if you could just raise your hand and identify yourself, that would be great. Um, so we have Glenn. I'm uh, Glenn Fukushima at the Center for American Progress. I want to thank the panelists for a very uh, stimulating discussion. Uh, I'd like to ask about the uh, three-party, three-country cooperation. Uh, although Ambassador Kim tried to emphasize the uh, cooperation among the three, I think all of us will agree that, uh, especially between Japan and South Korea, the cooperation could be increased and enhanced. Uh, I have the impression uh, in Japan that some people believe that uh, it's not exactly clear what it is that South Korea needs in order for the relation to get back on track, that the goalpost seems to be moving. And so I'd like to ask the two Korean panelists, uh, what exactly is it that Japan needs to do in order to get back on track with regard to the heads of state having meeting and, and getting back uh, to uh, the ability to cooperate uh, to the full potential of the, the United States, uh, Japan, and, and Korea? And to the American panelists, I'd like to ask, uh, what advice, concrete, specific advice, are you providing to the two parties in order to uh, get back on track in cooperation. Thank you. Okay, Ambassador Chet, would you like to yeah. respond to Glenn's question? Um, what, what do the South Koreans want to see? First of all, the trilateral cooperation between Japan, the U.S., and Korea, Korea is in favor of increasing the, the cooperation, even in the security field. And because the three countries, in a way, serve as an anchor to the anti-East Asian stability and development. We are spreading the market economy, we are spreading democracy, and uh, to the extent that China accepts the values we three countries share, will make us more secure and more prosperous. So we are in favor of trilateral cooperation, except, except on the security front, if three countries want to uh, take action Aiming at China, Korea cannot be part of that cooperation, that element of cooperation. Why? Because we share frontier with China. We have millions of Korean expatriates living in China. We have a North Korean problem. So we have a, our interest is not totally the same as yours, Japan and the United States. So even though we share the large part for the trilateral cooperation, there are small portion in case the three countries want something against aiming at China in terms of security, Korea cannot be part of it. And regarding bilateral cooperation, uh, I don't see any other means than model modeling through. Because we have a fundamental differences. If we ignore it, uh, it will be illusory. So let's just see what, what we are, each other's. And there are some uh, basic elements on which we do not agree. So it's better to, to see the things as they are and model through and give time the chance. Song, 50th anniversary of Korea-Japan normalization. What can the US do? Yeah, I, you know, Another variation of that question is, you know, will the U.S. mediate, mediate sure. between uh, yeah. Japan and Korea? And the answer, as you know, is no. Uh, but as a good friend and as a close ally, I mean, we obviously encourage both countries to, to try to deal with some of the outstanding issues. But I think the basic ad uh, advice um, is what the president indicated in some of his recent uh, public comments, which is that um, it's important for the U.S., it's important for the two countries to look forward to find areas of cooperation and to strengthen trilateral cooperation, um, even as they work to address some of the issues from the past. So I don't think we're, anybody's suggesting that you should dismiss the, this very important, painful issues from the past, but it's you know, obviously we should look forward as well. 
Um, and I think that's, that's what all three countries want to do. And in fact, that's why we do, even as they deal with the difficult issue of comfort women, um, we're finding opportunities for trilateral cooperation, the information sharing agreement, and you know, trilateral defense talks, um, uh, policy coordination on North Korea, et cetera. So I think uh, I'm not muddled through maybe a bit too strong. I think we'll, we'll be fine. <laughs> Rich? <laughs> Glenn, nice to see you. Um, just a reminder, I'm all for the tripartite uh, cooperation. It is important for all the reasons my distinguished colleagues have mentioned, uh, and we need it. But let's be clear. The relationship between the Republic of Korea and Japan, or well, the United States and the Republic of Korea, for that matter, the United States and Japan has not always been clear sailing. Uh, we had normalization uh, between the Republic of Korea and Japan in, in 1965, but you've had plenty of small explosions since then. While it was, while it was a kidnapping of Kim Dae-jung uh, from Tokyo in the early 70s, or, or attempted assassinations in Seoul, et cetera. So I think we've got to be clear. Let's not hyperventilate. We've got a problem. We've got a problem primarily between uh, Korea and Japan uh, that has historical significance. It can be resolved, and generally, we have been able to resolve rocky times in our relationship. And I mentioned the United States has had difficulties uh, with uh, Japan and the famous Nixon shock of China. And, and for that matter, the United States has turned our back from time to time on the Republic of Korea with very bad consequences. Most uh, notably, I think Dean Acheson and Mr. Truman's comments about uh, Korea being outside our defense perimeter. So these relationships take work. And that's what uh, Ambassador Sung Kim and his colleagues are doing. They're working it hard, and they're working in the best possible way they can. And let's uh, not take caution of our fears here. Thanks. Uh, Chris Nelson. Uh, thanks so much. Uh, great discussion. Uh, uh, just a quick follow-up on, on Glenn. They're closing the Akura. What in the hell are we going to do? That's a terrible situation. But anyway, um, <laughs> I did have a serious Sorry. question. Uh, uh, you know, in looking at what we're saying and doing, um, it's a bit like the Colin Powell distinction between changing regime and the regime changing uh, itself. Uh, and a lot of what we're talking about with North Korea, in terms of what we're doing about North Korea, it looks like we are pushing to change the regime literally. Uh, how, is there maybe a better way we can talk about what we're doing with sanctions and with human rights and with all the pressure we're bringing for obviously legitimate reasons that uh, doesn't look in Pyongyang as though it just confirms the whole hostile policy rubric that we hear all the time, including KCNA's today rather chilling uh, threats of nuclear war, very charming. Uh, uh, and then specifically on the, on the uh, Japan-Korea uh, uh, problem. Um, a year or so ago, President uh, uh, Obama stood next to President Park and made very strong, very heartfelt, uh, very public remarks about the comfort women and, in a sense, advising uh, Prime Minister Abe to stop this, stop this agitation. Uh, but in the last few weeks, it seems to have gotten uh, 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 stronger uh, and now uh, involves uh, American textbook publishers. Is it time uh, for the president to speak out, as he did a year and a half ago, is uh, do we need to hear more of the kind of, of uh, friendly, concerned remarks as we did from Rich Armitage and, and, and Joe Nye last, last uh, December when you guys were there, uh, talking very frankly about Yasukuni and, and, and the cover women, uh, giving friendly advice as a friend on, on how to talk about these things. Uh, if we don't do this, if the president doesn't speak out, if you guys don't speak out, what evidence do we have that Abi is not going to continue to push this revised view on comfort women and Nanjing incident, for that matter, uh, and things will not muddle through, they'll, be, they'll get worse. So uh, uh, that's a really serious issue that seems to be bubbling up as long as it keeps going the way it's going. Uh, so we're not talking about mediating here, in a sense, we're talking about you know, it, 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 friendly adult supervision of, uh, of mutual friends. Thank you. Um, okay, so, so I guess there are two questions there. One is, so with the human rights and with the sanctions, the executive order, I mean, the, you know, is this a hostile policy from the perspective of Pyongyang uh, that the United States and its allies are pursuing? And then the second question, 
think really is to Sung, should the president speak out on this as on the issue, the historical issues as he had, had as he had done with President Park uh, last year. So, um, Rich, do you want to take the question about whether we have a hostile policy towards North Korea? Where's the which? Whether we have the United States has a hostile policy towards North Korea with the sanctions and the human rights and. Well, uh, if our support for our colleagues in Seoul and for their right to exist free from threat from North Korea is hostile to North Korea, then it's hostile. Uh, from my point of view, it's not hostile enough. <laughs> <laughs> we ought to put unremitting, unrelenting pressure on that regime and use things that really get their attention, like the United Nations uh, report on human rights recently and the rather stunning vote when you look at the number who voted uh, for the resolution against those stalwarts such as China, Cuba, Russia, Zimbabwe, which voted against it. I remember when we were doing negotiations in, back in 2005, we used to, the North Koreans used to say, you have a hostile policy towards us, and we'd say, we only have a hostile policy towards your nuclear weapons. With regard to the rest of your people and everything, we don't have a hostile policy. <laughs> Sung, what about this, uh, Chris's question about this history issue? Yeah, you know, I'm not sure I have much more to add than what we've said already. I mean, this is something that we care very deeply about. Um, and we, of course, engage both uh, Japanese senior officials and Korean senior officials about this issue and encourage both sides to find a way forward. Um, you know, I'm not, I can't answer whether the president would, should um, make a public statement about it. But I think in general, uh, you know, probably quite diplomacy uh, could be more effective um, in the situation. As Victor pointed out, I mean, this is um, an important anniversary year for Korea and Japan. Uh, and we hope that, um, that both sides will make a sort of stronger effort um, to get relations back on track as they lead up to the anniversary milestone in June. Mm -hmm. okay. yeah. I should mention that General Sharp is with us as well, former USFK commander. So. He's probably seen a lot of North Korea's hostile policy towards us. <laughs> <laughs> I agree with Rich. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, yes, on, on that, though, Victor, I mean, I, I can't remember any time uh, in which the North Koreans did not think we had a hostile sure. policy. Yeah. So, I mean, I think it's a fairly consistent theme, and yeah. it's, that, that should not be dictating our policies. Uh, yes, next question. Um, yes, right here. Hi, uh, my name is Sung Woo Choi. I'm a Korean student from the George Washington University. And I would like to ask both uh, uh, US and Korean ambassadors that recently um, two Japanese hostages were killed by uh, ISIS. And it seems like Prime Minister Abe wants to reinterpret their pacifist con uh, constitution. And I wonder what is the both U.S. and Korean uh, stance on this. Yeah. There, there's, so the U.S. and Korean stance on reinterpretation of the Constitution. Okay. So U.S.-Korean stance on reinterpretation of the Constitution. Who would like to go first? That's uh, the The collective security is acknowledged by the United Nations. So per se, it shouldn't make any, any problem even to South Korea. Uh, but the, the problem may arise when this question is linked with larger issues of revision of the history. So because of this, we are concerned. But as a principle, who can oppose it? But we would be less concerned if Japan has a, a uh, desirable attitudes interpretation of regards its own past. Um, first of all, on the hostage situation, as you know, we have expressed our deepest condolences to uh, the families of the victims, as well as the people of Japan. I think this is the brutal, tragic uh, uh, murders. Um, I agree with uh, Ambassador Chair that you know, this collective self-defense principle is something that's enshrined in the UN Charter, so there's no reason to, to um, challenge it. Um, and if you so look into what uh, US and Japan have been doing to strengthen US-Japan alliance, uh, 
Um, and I think that's very much consistent with uh, what Japan and Prime Minister Abe wants to do in terms of collective self-defense and Japan being able to contribute more constructively to not just regional efforts, but global efforts as well. Um, so, you know, Prime Minister Abe's statements after the, the brutal killings, I think, are completely understandable. And I think it's very consistent with what US and Japan are trying to do together. Okay. Uh, I think we have time for just a couple more. So, uh, yes. Uh, it's coming here. Hello, my name is In Song Shim, the Yonamnus correspondent to Washington. It was great. It was great discussion. So it, thanks for the great discussion, and it was very useful. My question is to Ambassador Kim about the talks about talks with North Korea. There was a report that you suggested suggested uh, suggested talks about talks with North Korea. The, the Washington Post reported at first, but while North Korea rejecting your proposal, they in, in return they invite you to come to Korea, North Korea, but the U.S. government to decline that because it might give some wrong signal to the world. And I want to hear you, I want to hear it from you directly, what has happened, and then is there any, another question is, is there any possibility for you to suggest again that kind of talks about talks or any possibility for you to visit North Korea for that kind of meeting? Talks about talks. Talk. <laughs> That's not a good English song. Talks about talks. <laughs> um, but I thought you were going to invite questions from the audience, not from the press. <laughs> <laughs> well, I didn't know you was press. So. Um, look, I mean, I'm not going to get into some details of uh, diplomatic communication. Um, but I think our position is well known uh, that you know, if the North Koreans are willing to talk seriously, about the issue of denuclearization, uh, we're willing to look for an opportunity to do so. Um, I think that's been our consistent position approach for a long time. In fact, that's uh, an approach taken by other members of the Six Party process as well. I mean, when you look at uh, Seoul's efforts to resume inter Korean dialogue, um, of course there are inter Korean issues, but I fully expect that that effort will also support uh, our common effort on denuclearization. Same thing for Japan-North Korea dialogue. Uh, of course, it's focused on the abductee issue, uh, but I would expect that the Japanese government would take the opportunity to uh, emphasize the importance of, uh, of returning to credible and meaningful negotiations on the nuclear issue. Um, so um, there's been a lot of wild speculation about you know, what's happening, uh, but let me assure you that there's been no change in our position uh, and approach on this issue. Um, we will um, continue to work with the international community uh, to strengthen sanctions enforcement. And I think the recent uh, disturbing development with the cyber attack on Sony is a reminder that we need to maintain that strong effort. Um, but at the same time, we will coordinate with our five party partners to look for an opportunity to resume um, credible, meaningful, serious negotiations on the nuclear issue. Um, ladies and gentlemen, that's about all the time we have this afternoon. I want to thank you all for coming. I want to thank our partner, Institute for Foreign Affairs and National Security, and uh, Samsung Electronics America for their help. Um, uh, and to our panelists, please uh, thank them for their efforts and all of their analysis. Thank you.